Stryker? Stryker, are you all right? Yeah. We're okay. Hi guys, welcome back to the channel. My name is Dave, and today I want to talk about SVOL with Eric McCardell from Simplify ETFs. Now, Eric was kind enough to come on the channel and talk about this product that income investors really love. It's been out for about three years. It distributes monthly income, and it does it at a rate of about 16% on an annual basis. So income investors love it. Now, I have reviewed this one before, and I'll link that up above, but uh, this is the quintessential review right here because having Eric on, not only could we talk about how it's constructed, but we could also talk about the recent VIX spike back in August from that Japan carry trade. So this was the first true test of SVOL. And I wanted to find out what it was like down there in the trenches. So uh, I wanted to see if it, I, I pictured it was like airplane, remember Ted Stryker? Uh, he's sweating crazy and he's trying to land that plane. That's how I pictured it, but uh, we'll find out if that's true. And uh, we'll also talk about the recent distribution cut. For this last distribution, they cut it just a little bit. Try to understand why they did that. So all that and more. If that is what you're looking for, please stick around. Boop. Thanks for taking the time to uh, come on and talk to me, Eric. I really appreciate it. Uh, so we're talking about SVOL today. And for those that are not familiar with this product, uh, can you kind of give us a summary about this ETF? Absolutely. Dave, great to see you again. Thanks for having me on. Um, so SVOL, as I'm sure many of your audience members are familiar with, is our volatility premium ETF. And really what that is, is a new way for investors to generate equity income. Uh, so we use a number of different ways to get income out of the equity volatility space, primarily with the use of inverse VIX futures contracts. And we position the portfolio in a way where we are really balancing uh, risk and reward and trying to give investors a good buy and hold solution across different market cycles. The Simplify website is one of the better put together websites for these types of products. So you guys create a lot of videos about these products as well. So, uh, you know, to fill in a lot of the blanks, because this one is a little bit more complicated or just a little bit different, um, I'll definitely link to the website below in that video so you can watch more about SVOL and watch Eric talk more about it in depth. But uh, yeah, a, a great product's been around for about three years, very high yield, which people really love. Um, one thing that I noticed is the gross expense ratio is, is pretty steep. It's, it shows as 1.16% on the website. So why are management fees so high for SVOL? I'm glad you bring that up, Dave, and that's something that you know, we get a lot of feedback on. And I'll, I'll first point out that the management fee, and so if you go to our website, simplify.us, and you scroll down, uh, once you're on the SVOL page, you scroll down to the fees and expenses section, you'll notice that there are a couple of line items. And the first one is management fee, right? And that one is at a uh, half a percent or 50 basis points. And that really is like what we are charging our investors, right? It comes out of the performance of the fund. Um, you know, it, it, when you see the performance of SFAL, it is net of that fee. There are also potential other line items. Uh, and the, the one that really stands out here is what's called other expenses. And that one is at about 66 basis points, 0.66%. And so obviously, you know, overwhelms the management fee component. And so the question then is, what is that? And what other expenses are are us passing through or displaying the cost of using what's called a repo, which is how we manage collateral in the portfolio. And so when we trade futures, we are balancing our collateral positions every day, every night. And ultimately there are occasionally some overnight expenses associated with that. Uh, it's a cost of doing business when you're trading futures. And it's something that we manage and try and mitigate um, across different market environments. Now, I will say that there is a, a benefit to this as well in that if you go and look at the annual statement of the fund, you'll notice that there is a substantial line item for interest income, right? Uh, unfortunately, we can't offset the expense out of that. Uh, we have to disclose the expense you know, on its own and we can't highlight the income component. But there are ways that we can generate additional yield on our cash and overnight repo facilities, uh, and we do so for our investors. One of the reasons that I really wanted to have you on was to talk about the VIX spike that we had back uh, early August. So we had the Japan carry trade, 
We had a few days before and a few days after, but uh, this was the first time since SVOL came out that we really had to deal with a large VIX spike. So SVOL, SVOL dropped about 10% during that period in time, but it rebounded quickly, just like the rest of the market. So it, based off of that spike, is there anything that your group now looks at and discovered, I guess, about the makeup of the fund? Well, we, we've designed SVOL for this type of event. And, you know, really what you want, how should I say this? Um, as a vol seller, so a seller of volatility, whether you're selling put options on the S&P, whether you're selling VIX futures like we are in SVOL, you expect to be a winner most of the time, right? It's the way insurance companies operate. Most of the time, you know, somebody is paying them a premium or cutting them a check to provide insurance. And, you know, you hope a hurricane doesn't come through and knock <laughs> all the houses down. Right. So we really built the portfolio around capturing the majority of those wins and doing so in a way where we don't have that much leverage or volatility on the overall portfolio, but can meaningfully and consistently generate income from the volatility complex, right? From selling VIX futures across the curve. Um, when it comes to the risk in short vol, Right. The risk is when that hurricane comes, right? Or that early August event when the VIX moved up to 65 in a day. Right. So one of the largest VIX moves in history. I think it was up, you know, I, I hate to quote VIX in percentage terms, but if you were to do so, VIX up like 190% in a day. Um, that is extreme. That is catastrophic. Right. And so what we do in S Fall is we are always allocating to a small percentage of catastrophic hedges, right? By buying call options on the VIX. And so when we went through that event, you can actually see in the portfolio, and if it's okay, Dave, I'm gonna share my screen here. During that event, you can really see that type of protection in play. And you'll notice that these, these contracts, these call options that we hold in s -Ball, they generally just expire worthless because hurricanes don't happen very often, right? But when you go through an event like that, you can see how very quickly those options that are, you know, priced anywhere from five cents to 20 cents can go as high as multiple dollars, right? And so we were very well positioned for that event. Um, it is, a, again, a cost of doing business in short vol where if vol spikes, you're going to feel a little bit of volatility. That's why you're getting paid the returns you get long term. Um, but we want to make sure that our investors are insulated or at least have um, serious downside mitigation against a major big spike like we saw. And with that, just looking at the drawdown that you mentioned, right? So S fall selling off about 10% over those you know, two or three days. If you look at other indexes that do a similar type of thing where they're harvesting VIX futures, right, but doing so with much more leverage and without any type of hedge in place, the drawdowns were truly catastrophic, right? And right. so that's really important for us in delivering this type of exposure. We know a lot of retirees are using our fund. We know a lot of you know, passive income investors are using our fund. We don't want you to have to worry about this type of event. and you know, we managed for that accordingly. All right. So nothing that you would tweak. You basically, you liked the way it performed during that period of time. The long VIX calls were doing their job. And that kind of ties into the next question. So this spike was over very quickly, right? It was really just one concentrated day. And then the VIX quickly subsided. I think it went from 16 up and back to 16 within a two-week period. So if the VIX was to stay elevated for a longer period of time, would we start to see like serious damage with SVOL? One of the really important features of markets is that when there is a dislocation, you will typically have um, other investors or traders come in and, and arbitrage out that dislocation, right? And so in the case of VIX futures, and I'm gonna share my screen once more here, I put a chart on showing what's called the VIX term structure uh, mm -hmm. at the end of July, right? So a couple of days before that major vol event. And this isn't the best image because you can't really see how upward sloping the curve is. But generally speaking, in risk markets, you expect a premium to, to 
long dated risk as opposed to near dated risk. And in vol, that's what we call implied volatility versus realized volatility. Now, VIX is a measure of implied volatility, but for the sake of simplicity, let's assume that the front is, you know, what actually happens in the market. And so typically you want to be harvesting this roll down, right? If you are selling a VIX futures contract at a point on the curve, all else equal over the next month, you want to be in a position to have that naturally fall. And therefore, when you buy back your contract, you buy it back at a smaller amount thus capturing the spread, which is the income component. So in a major vol event, what happens is this front part of the curve, and this is what we refer to as VIX, right? VIX will spike. It generally drags the front of the curve up much more than, say, the back end, right? And you can see that in the rate of change here at the bottom. And when that happens, if you are short the contract, again, the more you know, close you are to the front of the curve, the more exposure you have to that initial volatility shock. Mm -hmm. Now, to answer your question, if let's say the curve stayed like this for a prolonged period of time, you'll notice that your short position, which not only just got punched in the mouth, you know, technical term, but now has to roll back up the curve, right? So if you're short and the value is going up, that's not good for you, right? That's where you could have, um, you know, some continued loss on the position. But again, the benefit of these types of, of dislocations is that, well, what, like you just said, right, what happened? The VIX went from the, the mid-teens to 65 back to the mid-teens within a, a week or two, right? And so if you're able to participate by selling this implied vol at the front or opening up new short positions, you expect the market to correct very quickly. Um, and so just to add some technical terms here, this upward sloping curve is what's referred to as contango. This inverted curve is what's referred to as backwardation in futures markets. Uh, most of the time, the vast majority of the time, the curve is upward sloping or in contango, whereas this backwardation is very, um, you know, a very rare event in markets. Okay, so that's so then you sell these, or I'm sorry, you buy calls in the VIX, usually a strike price of 50. So let's say, are the calls set to handle a period where the VIX is elevated for a longer period of time, or are they just in place to offer some relief? So would it, the calls just offset a little bit of the pain, I guess, is that the idea uh, of the call option? Yeah, they, the, the two primary features of S-Fall are level, uh, of VIX, right? So, you know, I use the, the technical term of getting punched in the mouth, right? So when you're mm -hmm. short at this VIX contract and this happens very quickly, that's that's the Mike Tyson punched in the mouth moment, right? right. The call options are mitigating that type of risk. We don't really focus on the role component as a mitigation, right? But we will structurally position based on where we think the opportunities are best in the role. So, okay. for example, what I mean by that is, like, if you look here, you'll notice that there is a pretty substantial roll down on the front of the curve. And this is pretty typical, right? You will find most of S-Ball's exposure as being short the front of the curve. And even after a crisis, we want to be there because what happens? You have the biggest potential delta as the market normalizes, right? Whereas if you're further out the curve, typically the role profile is much flatter. Therefore, the income you generate is flatter, but you have less exposure to a vol shock. And so I know you had a question, we'll get into this in a little bit, but we've had some, you know, some of our mutual clients and mutual audience members look at uh, products or exposures that have, you know, positions that are say in the middle part of this VIX curve, right? And so that's really the functional difference between S fall, which can be dynamic across this curve, and then some other exposures that are fixed to particular spots on the curve. In this uh, moment of crisis, uh, so uh, how is the fund managed when a VIX spike occur occurs in real time? Is this uh, is a rules based approach, or is this truly a managed ETF? Because I kind of picture, you know, I remember talking to Silish uh, over there. I, kinda, I get this like Ted Stryker in airplane view, you know, where he's pouring down <laughs> sweat trying to land the plane. Or is, or is it more rules-based? Does it kind of, kind of have your components all built out? Shilash is pretty cool and collected. So <laughs> uh, if he sweats, I've never seen it. But um, 
there is a combination, right? We know that there are uh, elements of the strategy that can be largely um, managed on a systematic basis, right? We know where parts of the curve tend to be winners most of the time. We know where those hedges are cost effective uh, across history, right? But when you go through an event like that, you really need to, one, have been positioned correctly heading into the event. And for us, that means, you know, not necessarily, like depending on the starting VIX level, mm. if we're coming into an event like that where VIX is already low, we kind of are waiting for some type of mean reversion back to average, right? We we look at that long-term level of VIX at, at 19 and we say, hey, if VIX is at 13 or 14, we're not necessarily going to go, you know, stuff our faces full of volatility risk, right? We're going to be a little bit more cautious here. And so we benefited from that in the event. We were a little bit underweight our risk, uh, which helps in a, a major shock like that. And then, of course, as I mentioned, the call option already well positioned. You know, that's just something that we we assume is not going to pay off most of the time. But when we go through an event like this, it's it's there for that reason, right? And so coming back out of the event, I think that's actually, you know, something that a lot of people don't think about, but we hear, we do hear comments on this observation, you know, is that after the drawdown, the fund re recovered very quickly, right? Every short big strategy out there recovered fairly quickly, but in particular, you know, pointing out with s -fall, having been a little bit underweight risk heading into the event and then moving back to full risk on when we were at that extreme inversion, right? Which is the opportunistic aspect of the strategy. And that's what Shailesh and our team do very well in, right? And saying, where do we expect a high reward to risk, um, you know, outcome? And then how do we position accordingly? And really, again, with the, the focus in mind of saying, we don't need to, to hit home runs every day. Right. right. We want base hits. We want our investors to be in a position where they can sleep easy at night. They can go on vacation and have S fall in their portfolio. And when they come back and, you know, look at it or check their statement, they're never, you know, too shocked by what happened. Right. It's, it's really designed for the investor that is going to set and forget. You know, president has that red button he gets to push. So Silas isn't sitting there going, not time to hit. So did you close out any of those uh, call options that uh, you owned at that point? during that last spike or did you write them out? So we, we were very close to, uh, we actually didn't hit the point where we would have, would have monetized. Um, and so even though we saw that major spike and you see that reflected in the performance of the fund, we held those in the event that the market, you know, kept moving higher. And okay. so what you can think about then is the drawdown that you saw on S fall and that type of vol event, we were very quickly approaching a point where the call option hedges are offsetting, you know, the, the VIX, uh, the short VIX exposure. And so kind of, um, I use this term and obviously we can't, you know, ever guarantee or be promissory about things, but, you know, I kind of talk about us having our back against the wall at that point, you're getting very close to the point where, you know, S fall is like putting up a good fight against a major VIX move higher. Um, and so, you know, that would have been really nice. Um, but at the end of the day, again, we're very pleased with the overall outcome. Okay. So yeah, it's almost like holding that insurance policy in your hand. You still have it. You don't sell it. So, And on that point, Dave, I, I will say like we are always ensuring that our short VIX exposure is 100% notional covered by a hedge, right? We are always hedged. All right. So I also noticed something that I, I don't remember seeing this before, but I noticed some SPX uh, options and there's some spreads in the fund. Um, what is, what's the purpose of those option trades? Is that something new? It goes back to the opportunistic nature of the fund, where if we see uh, protection or you know potential insurance that we think is well priced in the market, or let's say we think um, you know it makes more sense to buy put options on the S and P than buy call options on VIX, we can do that you know simultaneously or or you know separate of each other. So for us, we look at equity markets and say, hey, they're near all time highs, and downside put option exposure is fairly cheap. Um, coming off the vol event, which was still a little bit more expensive, we felt that that was a, a good way to diversify our hedges. Okay. And just a reminder, right, because s fall is equity income. And so, you, you know, our shareholders should expect the portfolio to have a positive beta to the equity markets. And so when we buy things like S&P put options, right, um, you know, S&P puts are, are a good way to protect against uh, VIX going higher. 
All right, now there are several ETFs out there that short VIX futures. Uh, one that I've been asked about recently is uh, ZIVB, um, and it's actually outperformed SVOL over the last year if you just look at total return. But for the average retail investor out there, which I'll put myself in that category, uh, why not just buy something like ZIVB, which is 100% short VIX futures. Uh, it's a 100% short VIX futures product versus SVL, which is 20 to 30%. It's a great question. And I can't talk about specific products, but I can talk about their underlying indices, right? And there happens to be an index that tracks uh, the same exposure. So 100% inverse VIX at those midterm contracts. So just referring back to the image we pulled up, right? Just as kind of a reference point for our, our audience here. So whereas we expect our exposure in SVAL to be primarily focused on the front of the curve, Mm -hmm. An exposure that is inverse VIX at the midpoint is going to be focused much more in this part of the curve. And now, you know, that's one key difference, right, is where you are on the curve. Another key difference is that the beta to VIX declines as you move across this curve. And I don't want to pull it up now just because I don't want to throw off the cadence here, but we do have a, a blog on our website that looks at the relationship of uh, VIX, you know, it's beta, uh, the VIX futures across you know, different tenors or different um, maturities, right? So um, again, just co confirming what I said, where the further out you go, you'll notice that these contracts didn't move as much when VIX spiked, right? Mm -hmm. and so what that means then is you can take more leverage or have more exposure to that part of the curve and expect lower volatility overall. That said, there isn't always a solid roll profile here. Again, you'll notice that this roll tends to be a little bit flatter. This mm -hmm. can change across different markets. And so I think, you know, strategies like what you mentioned or that type of index exposure, that type of ETF, they're just other ways to play this market and, and to harvest that volatility premium. And I'm a fan of that. I think if you do it intelligently, if you're conscious of the risks in these markets, um, that they can be really uh, effective tools. Now, I will mention, though, and I, I, again, I don't have a chart for this, but I'll just put it out there for your audience. If you go and pull up the chart of what you, the, the ticker you mentioned during the recent August crash, right, you'll notice that the drawdown was quite substantial, right? And that's just a function of having more leverage. So diversified portfolio of these types of things, and then again, knowing which ones are holding call option hedges, uh, the exposure you mentioned, to my knowledge, is not holding any type of hedge. Um, that's just something that, that audience members should be aware of. Yeah, the drawdown for SVOL was around 9 to 10%, and for ZIVB, it was about 25 to 26%, so significantly higher. You know, overall, I think Simplify does a, a really outstanding job here of creating unique products, and I think that's what I, what I find so fascinating about your particular group. Um, I've reviewed several of them in the past. Uh, I probably will continue to do that. So give me what I'm going to do next. Are there any uh, other products out there that I should be looking at that we uh, would like to discuss at the moment from Simplify? Anything that you find that you think might tie in well with what we're talking about with SVOL, whether it pairs up well or complements SVOL or might just be a new product that you're spinning off? So sticking with the theme of income and sticking with the theme of volatility harvesting, right, which is, um, you know, there are many different flavors of it, especially in the equity world. One area I would like to bring your attention to is fixed income volatility, right, which is, I think, often overlooked. But after we've gone through a serious bond bear market in the past couple of years, volatility and fixed income, as shown by the move index on screen in white, against equity vol in blue remains fairly rich. And so as a volatility seller, you want to sell vol when it's expensive and you want to buy it when it's cheap, typically. And that's not always the rule, but, you mm -hmm. know, it's a good heuristic. And so vol, again, in fixed income, fairly rich. The Fed has just started cutting interest rates, which is their way of bringing vol down in the fixed income market. And so you can kind of view that Fed you know, decision as a potential tailwind for future vol dropping. And so we still like this opportunity. We think it's going to be here for a while or at least until proven otherwise. And so uh, a few ways that we, we capture that opportunity are by selling 
fixed income volatility, selling treasury futures options, uh, specifically put options on treasury bonds. And we do that in two products in particular, um, our strategy BUCK, which is a uh, treasury and option strategy. So it has no duration, no credit exposure, and uh, really just focuses on treasury bills and then runs a, a option overlay. Uh, we also have AGH, uh, which is our core bond position. So giving you really the bond benchmark or the bond index benchmark with that option overlay on top, uh, both of which also managed by Shailesh Gupta, who does run SFAL. And so, um, you know, I'm biased clearly, but uh, working with Shailesh and, you know, Shailesh and I have been at a Simplify really since the early days. And um, I have a lot of confidence in him and his process. And um, he's an excellent portfolio manager. Good to know. All right. I'll definitely check those out. I, I have reviewed HGGH before, but I'll check out Buck as well and see what we got going on there. As far as distributions go, on an annual basis, SVOL distributes around 16% currently. And that yield's been very uh, steady right at around 30 cents. But it sounds like there is going to be a, a small cut to that distribution rate. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. And uh, our, our filming of this episode today coincides with our, our declaration date for S fall for the end of the month. Uh, I know a lot of viewers, a lot of your audience members are probably eager to watch that at the end of each month. And we appreciate that. Um, we did reduce our distribution for the first time in, in a good while. Uh, we dropped it from 30 cents to 28 cents a share, uh, which puts an in, in indicated yield on the fund of just north of 15%. Um, what we do in S fall, and we, you notice we don't make dividend policy changes often. Uh, we try and keep the amount very consistent given where the market is, what the market backdrop looks like. But if we see things that change meaningfully, we will adjust our policy accordingly. And so the primary thing that's changed, you know, I mentioned earlier in the conversation or, or later, depending on how this gets edited, but, um, you know, I mentioned that as VIX levels change, right, we take different amounts of equity vol risk, right? So if VIX is kind of on the lower end of its long-term average, we are going to be generating a little bit less of our income from equity vol. And we were fortunate in that interest rates have been pretty high over the last two years as the Fed has, you know, raised rates, meaning we can put our cash collateral in things like treasury bills, we can buy investment grade bonds, which have you know a higher yield than cash typically does, right? And so, using that yield as a component of the distribution on on S fall just means that when those rates start to come down, you know that part of the yield is somewhat variable, right? And so, as rates start to come down, we would expect all else equal S falls distribution uh, rate to drop just a little bit. Um, now, again, over time, we expect to kind of aim for give or take what we're paying out now on a yield perspective. Um, but if the market conditions change, you know, and, and they would change for every fund or every exposure as well. Uh, again, our primary focus is to be very consistent overall and sustainable in how we pay out a distribution rate. And that, that rolls into uh, taxes as well. Obviously, we don't give tax advice to anybody. But I think you have a very good downloadable spreadsheet. I'll look for that and I'll, I'll plug that in here too as well. But I think taxes for SVOL all come out pretty much as ordinary income. Uh, so this might be really probably better in a tax deferred account. It can work in a taxable account because it's such a rich distribution amount. But is that correct as far as your understanding, all ordinary income? Primarily uh, income from VIX futures comes out as ordinary income. Uh, and then whatever collateral we're using can have different different types of income classification. But to your point, on our website, if you go to the bottom left-hand side, there's a link there called Tax Resources. You can also email us at info at simplify.us, and we'll point you in the right direction. I really appreciate you coming on and explaining this. I think you filled in a lot of blanks. Hopefully this helps people out make a, to make a decision on if this is right for them and their portfolio. So appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dave, and thanks to everyone who watched. So it was great to catch up with Eric and get his perspective on this particular fund. I am an owner of SVOL. I do consider it an alternative product, so it goes in my alternative bucket, which means my allocation is relatively small to my portfolio. Anything in my mind that yields 15 or 16% obviously is going to carry more risk versus something that's going to yield 4 or 5%. So 
I keep it relatively small, but I think it's a good product and I am an owner. So uh, let me know what you think about this particular product. Are you an owner? Are you considering it? Did I convince you one way or another after watching this video? Let me know down below. And if you like this type of content, please like and subscribe and we'll see you next time. Have a great night.